All right, I've given you three challenging questions, and uh, I'm going to start with Vice President Shindas in part. So Wednesday, I am told, is an extremely busy day in Brussels. It's when the commissioners all come together for some very important meetings, and the vice president is able to give us 30 minutes, which we are so grateful. So I'm going to start with you. I'm going to drill down a little bit, and we know we're going to excuse you. I may hop into your chair. So, uh, so um, Mr. Vice President, what is the historic thread? You just saw the historic video. What's the, what is history telling you today about how the transatlantic relationship, how the European Union is meeting these challenges for today? Good morning, everybody. I, I, I would say that uh, uh, the transatlantic relationship is, above anything else, a union of values. That's what brings us together. That's what kept us together. And even at times we, the European Union, sometimes were felt alone in this relationship uh, recently. <laughs> now I'm, we are delighted that the transatlantic bond is now stronger than ever before. So this union of values is what allowed us with our American partners to rebuild a continent ravaged by war in the 50s and 40s. And I'm sure that this union of values will now allow us to reconstruct Ukraine. Actually, I think it will be easier now than it was at the time. Well, that is a, that is a hopeful message. Your portfolio is one of the, the broadest and I would argue the most challenging because your portfolio, which you have the most interesting title, the European way of life, um, but you're focusing a lot of your time on migration. We know that's an incredible challenge and opportunity for the transatlantic relationship for the US, certainly our southern border. Uh, we know the challenges of migration. How are you solving the problem of migration? How do we see this? Because the next generation, uh, we need to have some answers to migration. Help us understand how you're working on that. Let me start with the portfolio. Uh, when Ursula gave me this job <laughs> back in uh, December 2019, she told me, I want you to be the most anthropocentric member of my team. I don't want you to do money, containers, tariffs. I want you to deal with policies that mean a lot to people's daily lives. And we brought under one single roof uh, in this portfolio what Emmanuel Macron called in Sorbonne l'Europe qui protège, a Europe that protects that has migration, public health, security, with a Europe of empowerment, with education, culture, skills, youth, mobility. So this is the European way of life. Of course, you choose migration as, and rightly so, I would say, because this is a, a central piece of these uh, portfolio responsibilities. We are trying to put together a European system for migration and asylum, one that does not exist. Um, and we are very close to get one, because uh, so far in this commission we've been more successful as firefighters on migration, running from crisis to crisis, from incident to incident, from instrumentalization moments, uh, rather than architects of a new system that uh, brings together our member states, is rules-based, is sustainable, and I'm very hopeful that in the next few months we'll get this big European agreement on migration. So I think you said two really important things, Pe policy or people. What the president was telling you is the technocratic things, while important, it's about people's daily lives. It's about democracy delivering. Uh, and, and for me, uh, the other thing that you said, you know, we kept saying never again. Well, never again just happened but never alone, and that is the value of allies. Is there one thing that you're concerned about as your children, as you pass the baton, the leadership baton to the next generation, what would be your advice to the next generation as they build the new Atlanticism? What issues do they have to concentrate on, and what are you most worried about? Well, I would say that uh, everything that uh, past generations and our generation has been uh, achieving is not given for the younger generation of Americans and Europeans. Sorry to break the bad news, but it's not given. The uh, 
we are surrounded by people who want to see the West fail, who hate us, who attack us, who do not spare any tool or instrument from disinformation to war to hybrid threats to make sure that uh, the West is, is, is not uh, an anchor of stability in, in the world, but a target. So for the younger generations, they would have to make sure that what they were giving them, it's sustainable. I, it's not going to be easy. Demography will not help us. Um, the, the rise of Asia will not help us. The uh, uncertainties around China, not good. Uh, but I still think that what we stand for, the model of society we represent, this union of values, is actually what people want to become. Uh, but President Zelensky was at the plenary of the European Parliament, and in his memorable speech, he mentioned the European way of life 21 times in his speech. And he said, we, want, we are fighting a war to live the way you live. And I extrapolate this to the Western way of life, to, to democracy, to values, to, to, to the fact that we are unique. Uh, we, are, we are a beacon of light in a world that is getting darker and darker. And this transatlantic beacon of light needs to, to remain uh, a shining uh, beacon. Thank you so much. Ambassador Smith, Julie, um, uh, your job changed after February 24th of last year as NATO ambassador. So I'm going to ask you the same questions. What, what history pulls at you as you uh, have been an incredible leader, I would say, very biasly, uh, incredibly active, visible? What is the history telling you about this moment and what are you doing in your job that helps prepare this relationship for the next generation? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's wonderful to be here at Brussels Forum with such a distinguished panel and great to see old friends and, and join the debate uh, again. Um, in terms of lessons that we can draw um, from history, I really enjoyed the framing of the session this morning with its emphasis on Atlanticism, looking back at 1941, the Atlantic Charter. What did we learn about that moment? We learned that war and the post-war periods have huge consequences for European security, for the structures that exist or need to be built globally, and we saw that then and we're seeing that now. This feels to all of us like a transformative moment. The sands are shifting. We're seeing developments across Europe, around the world that seemed unimaginable just a year or two ago. First of all, obviously, it's unimaginable that we have a land war in Europe right now, the first we've seen since World War II. But it's also unimaginable that Sweden and Finland would have knocked on the door last summer asking for full-fledged membership, something many of us didn't see coming. Um, unimaginable in many ways to see the leadership that the European Union has provided on lethal s assistance, security assistance to the people of Ukraine and their military commanders. So we feel, all of us, I think intuitively, that we are at that moment again. And in terms of the lessons that the Alliance are, is kind of drawing collectively right now, two themes. I would say resilience and adaptability. And here, to see the Alliance respond to this moment to come home to its core mission of collective defense, support Ukraine, and adapt to new security challenges like climate security, like emerging and disruptive technologies, malicious cyber attacks. This is an alliance that can cope with a return to its core mission and a war in Europe while looking forward and talking about the Indo-Pacific and protecting its technological edge or maintaining its technological edge. So, when you say 75 years, NATO's going to turn 75 next year, I think sometimes it takes you to, oh, that sounds, you know, a little bit creaky and a little bit old and dated. But in fact, in this moment, when the world feels like it's turning upside down, particularly in the European security architecture and the European security realm, 
This is an alliance that is ready for new challenges. It can adapt. It can draw from 75 years of experience and answer the question for the next generation, why does this alliance matter? What's in it for us? How has it evolved since it was created 75 some years ago? Julie, I was, I've been struck and we're excited that uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg will be with us later today. How much emphasis the Secretary General has placed on climate and NATO and understanding the security implications of climate? Could you spend a, just a second helping us understand what NATO's vision is as we all address the climate crisis, I would add emerging technologies into that because that is the future challenges that this alliance, and I have to say, it may be 75, but it's the new 35 to me. <laughs> that's, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. But help us understand how NATO is embracing the new the new. Sure, challenges. I mean, Secretary, the Secretary General Stoltenberg has just been a leader uh, on this issue in particular, but frankly, he's just been a leader full stop, period. Um, his leadership over the last year has been absolutely ind indispensable and we are all so grateful for that um, and thrilled that he agreed to stay on for another year um, when it came time to determine who his successor would be. But it's not just the Secretary General. Really, the alliance has come together to say, look, security is no longer about or just about tanks rolling across a border. NATO was designed to address conventional military threats. But today, security is broadly defined. Security includes building resilience. It includes looking at things like critical undersea infrastructure. It includes getting at the heart of climate security. And that's why NATO has kind of put a marker on the map to say, we will not be the leading multilateral institution tackling climate. There are plenty of other organizations that can take that on. But we will take on the implications of climate change for our collective security. So we are looking at this from multiple angles, whether it's looking at civil preparedness, making sure that our forces have what they need to operate and respond to really tough climate events. We're thinking about how climate affects security and can lead to conflict or crises based on things like water scarcity. Um, we're talking about lowering the emissions of, of NATO forces. So climate runs through a lot of our work. We think about it. It's part of our strategic concept that we rolled out last summer, which is, in essence, our mission statement. Um, and so I think you're going to see the alliance in the years ahead moving out not to solve the climate uh, crisis, but to play a critical role in addressing climate security related issues. I'm going to ask uh, you a question, both of you and Vice President Chintas, on how we're doing with public opinion for the next generation. I love the NATO campaign, hashtag we are NATO. I tell everyone and my kids really hate when I say this, I'm like, I have to make my children care as much about NATO as I do. I'm not doing so hot. <laughs> um, so help, how is NATO breaking through for next generation? Are you monitoring opinion polls? And I want to say the same thing on the EU because the opinion polls that I've been seeing, it is popular for young people. But again, how are we pay att paying attention to what they are interested in while these important multilateral institutions are doing that heavy lifting? How do you, younger polling political understanding? Well, of course, yes, the NATO alliance is very interested in how the next generation looks at the alliance, its role, its purpose, particularly in this moment. We do a lot of engagement ourselves, both at US NATO and across the alliance to engage younger audiences, to bring them into the conversation. I think the polling generally sho shows that the next generation fundamentally understands what sits behind the entire purpose of the alliance, and that's either never alone or stronger together, depending on how you want to couch it. But there are tough questions out there about what is NATO doing on the top security challenges as defined by the next generation. And so we want to make sure that we're engaging in a conversation. We're hearing the concerns of young people, that we have answers for them on how the alliance is going to address 
address emerging and disruptive technologies, some of those new challenges above and beyond the current challenge of the war in Ukraine. I will say, though, in the Euro-Atlantic area, I feel that NATO is on a strong footing. I think we do have some work to do globally in terms of how the NATO brand is perceived and interpreted, and I think that's part of our work inside NATO right now as well, not just focusing on what the next generation tells us about how they see the future of the alliance from inside their Euro-Atlantic neighborhood, but how collectively communities in Latin America or Africa and the Middle East or Asia look at the NATO alliance as well. Absolutely. Vice young, President. Young Europeans love the European Union. They experience it, they travel, they, they were born Europeans, unlike my generation. They experienced Erasmus, mobility, cheap flights, summer holidays, exchanges. This is something that makes young Europeans Europeans. I, may I remind you that in the Brexit referendum, young Brits voted massively in favor of remaining in the European Union. There is a risk, however. The risk is that younger Europeans consider most of our accomplishments as something given. That was, something, that was always like that. They do not have experiences of a borders Europe, of checkpoints, of passport controls. My younger son, when he was at school, he had to write an essay. And he came to me and said, Dad, I need some help. I said, what? I said, what does the word custom mean? It's, it's a logical question to ask because th this guy has never seen something that is custom. So we have now two challenges in front of us. First is the European election next year. This is the second most populous election on the planet after the Indian election, so we have to get it right. Last time we had a record uh, participation of younger Europeans. This time we have to do even better. And the second challenge and probably it's odd to hear this from a Brussels figure like myself. I think the key to success, bringing young Europeans with us, is to de brusselize the discussion on the European Union. Take it out of this town. Uh, take it to where people live, to uh, town hall meetings, uh, farmer uh, meetings, uh, uh, you know, NGOs. We, we need a debate about Europe to go beyond the boundaries of the, the Brussels bubble, where Brussels speak to Brussels a bit what we're doing now. Uh, this is not the way to get people to vote in the European election. I think we just have a new word, de -brusselize. We're going to unpack that one a little bit later. I would add a third challenge to your son. He just would need to do chat GPT to come up with the <laughs> yes. paragraph. And Quite. And that's a challenge to the educational system. So you heard two government responses. Now let's turn to the private sector. Because just as it happened in the Marshall Plan, the private sector was a major engine, technology, know-how, how to build uh, robust uh, economies. So let me turn to Steve Began. Um, private sector, but also former government, former Deputy Secretary of State in the Trump administration. Steve, I'm going to ask you the same questions. What about this history speaks to you that informs what we should be building in the future? And then what are the single issues that you are focusing on that you believe will help shape that agenda and that initiative? Well, thank you, Heather. I want to uh, echo Ambassador Smith's compliment on how you've framed this. Okay. We look at the, um, the founding generation and, and, the, and we're very quickly moving to the next generation. And, and I think that really makes a lot of sense. And I hope that remains a theme uh, throughout this day. The, um, I, I too reflected on the 1941 Atlantic Charter as I was thinking about this discussion. And you think about that moment in August of 1941 and where we were, where, where Churchill and Roosevelt were in the war that became known as World War II. In 1941, the, the Blitz of London and the Battle of Britain had just ended. Hitler occupied virtually the entire continent of Europe and had just begun to turn his, his attack to the east to attack Russia. We were before most of the major battles that were going to happen in Europe and, 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 and globally. It was before Pearl Harbor. 
it was it was before the United States mastered the nuclear weapon and uh, and ended the war in Japan. You think about the statement, the eight point statement that those two leaders released that talked about disarming the uh, enemies of democracy, of op uh, creating a world of open economic relations and free trade, of self-determination and respect for borders and sovereignty principles that became the founding principles uh, uh, that upon which Europe is organized today. It was either an act of extraordinary confidence or of incredible hubris to be sitting there in August of 1941 and make a statement like that that envisioned the defeat of Hitler and ultimately the defeat of the Japanese Empire as well. And so I wonder uh, when they made that statement, if they knew that from that, and by the way, with the endorsement of all the allies uh, afterwards, including the Soviet Union, actually, uh, for that Atlantic Charter, I wonder if they envisioned what would come from it. The United Nations, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, or the WTO, the international monetary system, all the things that, that were born of that moment. And maybe it was a combination, maybe it was both confidence and hubris, but I have to say that that's what I hope we can find at this moment, and that's what I hope we can give to the next generation, is that optimism and that confidence, perhaps bordering even a little bit on hubris. And so for the next generation, uh, and, and for this generation too, my biggest concern is that we've lost our confidence, whether it's uh, in relation to the, you know, and I don't, I don't in any way uh, underestimate the challenges even within our democratic societies, but whether it's that, whether it's the constant bombardment of gloomy news, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, whether it's the, the rise of a new economic power in the Indo-Pacific and the potential challenges that presents to our democratic societies. Um, a little bit more confidence on the part of our current leadership uh, might actually give a little bit more optimism to the next generation. You know, what, uh, one of the things I think is missing, and in, in, in this does come from the private sector perspective, is I don't think we have a very ambitious economic agenda. We seem to be balkanizing our economies. And I, and I really hope that we can rise above this moment and, and look at ways to breathe life into that very important part of the Atlantic Charter which is opening markets around the world, reducing tariffs, creating free trade and economic interdependence. We should start by making this, again, a core part of the transatlantic relationship. Um, Steve, does the private sector feel like you're getting, it's getting caught in the crossfire, the geostrategic crossfire? For the last 20 years, globalization has really meant the private sector could, could engage those new markets. I agree with you, the trade models are, are in the 90s. We need to create some new tools. How are companies like Boeing, and I'm sure um, you were brought on board very much because you understand how to navigate these geopolitical uh, choppy waters here. How does the private sector navigate sanctions and open markets, closed markets? They're really getting caught in this. How do you, na how do you manage it? Well, companies need foreign policies and, and companies need uh, geopolitical thinking inside the, inside the senior ranks. It is, it is a complex world. It's changing rapidly. Um, it was always always going to be the case that companies had to navigate geopolitics, but in a moment, in an inflection point like we are in right now, uh, in geopolitics, with the rise again of a new economic power in Asia, and with the challenges that we face here in Europe, and and, and also even within our own societies, um, it requires companies to be very agile and and uh, also uh, resilient, and so uh, it isn't easy. The, the most of most of uh, the world's companies, major companies, grew up in a world from the 1980s to just maybe the last decade, uh, where it was exactly that permissive world that uh, I was describing. That I think was very much the vision of of Churchill and Roosevelt when they met in the North Atlantic off the coast of Canada in 1941. Um, but it but it comes with challenges, and in 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 it without without a doubt that companies like Boeing, uh, companies like Microsoft have to be agile to be able to address that and, and still maintain the successful businesses that they've developed over, in our case, over a century. Jenny, thank you for your patience when I come to you because Microsoft has really been uh, caught in some crossfire, uh, trade crossfire, but also on the cusp with open AI of you know, revolutionizing how we do our work, how do we do our business. 
your particular job and something that we at GMF are also working very hard on election integrity, because there has to be, speaking of confidence, trust and confidence in our election. I'm going to ask the same questions. What moment of history pulls that you think, and how is Microsoft, how does it think corporately about managing uh, today's challenges, getting the next generation ready to manage the speed of change that Microsoft is bringing to us as well as other companies? Sure. From a historical standpoint, particularly looking at World War II, obviously there are a lot of comparisons of what's similar to what we're seeing today, what's different. Um, and one thing that we look at is sort of the way that during World War II, critical infrastructure was protected um, from, from missiles. Um, and there was a lot of tunnels. Things were put in tunnels and that was the way that critical infrastructure was protected. That's the way that the British government was able to maintain their operations was by operating in a place where they felt like they were safe. The current version of that and what the Ukrainian government realized very quickly was that the version of tunnels now is the cloud. And they, they took on a, a really very fast turnaround from what had originally been um, a, a, a pretty standard policy of every piece of data and, and infrastructure stays within the country to acknowledging the risk that they faced by doing that and instead started working with multiple companies, Microsoft included, to create a cross-European um, cloud for redundancy and backup and infrastructure. And so there are historical comparisons, but there are also some differences. So I'll fast forward a little bit to 2017. Um, to another moment that um, that we the whole world should you know look back on and reflect, which was the NotPetya attack. A couple things to note about that that we should all be reflecting on in this conversation. One is that was a pivotal moment of Russia attacking Ukraine that spilled over and had global consequence. Billions of dollars of productivity was lost. Companies all over the world and in Europe in particular were dramatically affected and their operations were shut down. But that was originally a Russia to Ukraine attack that had spillover effect. And so there's a lot that we can look on and compare when we think of the attacks happening physically in Ukraine right now and all of the reasons why we should care so much about containing and stopping it there before we all experience the spillover effect. Um, the other thing to acknowledge there is the role that the private sector, particularly the tech sector, played during that attack that has had uh, longevity into the current war. Uh, during the NotPetya attack, there were a, the cyber experts across the world became uh, intimately connected to the Ukrainian cyber defenders. And on February 23rd, the day before the full-scale invasion, those same cyber defenders in Ukraine were talking to Microsoft's threat analysis center, Mystic, as they identified an increase of Russian hostility and cyber attacks against Ukraine. And some people have even said those were the first shots fired in, in the war was that cyber attack the day before the full-scale invasion. Those relationships were formed during that NotPetya um, attack and maintained over time so that Microsoft Mystic folks knew exactly who to call, who to warn, what signals to, to discuss, and that has continued throughout the war. Those relationships were formed. But it's a real interesting question to say, well, what is the role of the private sector now in these geopolitical environment? It's different than it was during World War II. Technology has been a part of war since the beginning of time, from the telegraph to the um, Turing machine. I mean, this is, this is not new, but the role of the private sector being essentially what you were saying, stakeholders in the center of it, whether we want to be or not, we are in the middle of it now. Um, and so there are obligations that come with that. And I agree with, with a lot of what you were saying, which was we need to make some serious decisions about where we engage and how we engage. But we also need the partnership of NATO and the EU and the US government um, to, to work with us on regulations, to work with us on rules and responsibilities, to share information. Because um, that is essential to making sure that we all can move forward. And ideally, what we're here to talk about today is how do we move past conversations in historical analysis and get to um, producing results in order to help the Ukrainian people. Yeah, I think, uh, Jenny, you're absolutely right. I think we're, we're talking about this whole of society approach. It takes government, it takes the private sector, it takes civil society. We've got, no one has just one lane. How do we bring this together? How do we galvanize it? And the relationships that we have to build and the networks we have to build, you have to be ready for the moment when it happens, not scrambling, not firefighting, I think, as, uh, uh, as the Vice President was saying, we've got to be prepared for this. So, okay, my one last question to all of you, and then I want to turn to the audience um, to grab your questions uh, uh, so we can keep going here. 
So I want you to fast forward, Jenny, right to your point for all four of you. Vice President, I'll start with you. So what does the new Atlanticism look like a decade from now? What would you believe, what does success look like? Is there a challenge that you're afraid of? So fast forward to me 10 years, where I'll be a little older and a little wiser, not in our current positions, probably, <laughs> maybe. You'll be there. Um, I take it as a compliment. Thank you. <laughs> um, what is it going to look like? Look, uh, I think that the key for the uh, success, the future success of the transatlantic uh, relationship, I would say it's double fold. First, twofold. First, to make sure that this is, uh, uh, as I was saying earlier, an anchor of stability for the world, but a rules based. Uh, anchor of stability, that um, it's, it goes beyond security, NATO, cyber, but it also encompasses the multilateral agenda, climate change, energy independence. I mean, the, the era of innocence is over for Europe. And the only way to stay strong, resilient, confident, trustworthy is with our American uh, partners, but beyond the remit of traditional transatlanticism built around NATO. This is key. The second part of success or litmus test for the transatlantic relationship would be, I think, post-war Ukraine. This is the elephant in the room and uh, uh, reconstructing Ukraine would be the way, the best way for the world to judge if the transatlantic relationship is something that people and the world can rely on. I think it will be easier this time than in the 40s. We know what we have to do. Uh, there's, no, there's now much more money around than it was in, in the 40s. And I sense uh, a strong political convergence in the main capitals of the axis of good that are determined to get it right. Julie, what does NATO look like at 85? Oh, goodness. Where does it need uh, to be? Uh, well, first of all, I would just echo the points that were just made. I mean, obviously, we hope that at that point we're in the middle of a reconstruction project. We're moving Ukraine towards its Euro-Atlantic aspirations and it's finding its, its place uh, in Europe. Um, but broadly, I would say, I think, <coughs> ensuring that we don't continue to have a literal interpretation of Atlanticism, um, that Atlanticism need not reflect only the values represented by the countries that border the Atlantic, uh, that Atlanticism, and we're seeing this inside the NATO alliance right now, Atlanticism is about working with other countries around the world, wherever they sit, on protecting the values that we all hold dear. And the way in which the alliance has enhanced its relationship with the Indo-Pacific just over the past four years really has been remarkable and a turning point in NATO's history. Not that NATO is gonna become a global alliance and we're gonna have members in the Asia Pacific, but that both the countries in the Indo-Pacific and the NATO alliance see utility in breaking down the silos that normally separate America's traditional Pacific allies from our Atlantic allies. And I think defining Atlanticism in a new way that doesn't necessarily have to run through the Atlantic will be part of our success going forward. Yeah, Julie, I like to say Atlanticism is not a geographic indication. It is a purpose-driven, confident state of mind. Steve, are we going to be able to get our confidence back? What would a confident policy look like in 10 years from now? So let me, uh, let me emulate the confidence bordering on, on arrogance hubris. and hubris of <laughs> Churchill and Roosevelt in 1941. It's a Euro-Atlantic area that's whole and free. In 10 years, a Ukraine that isn't just a NATO member, but is several years a NATO member, not just an EU member, but several years an EU member. A vision for a Euro-Atlantic whole and free that doesn't stretch just to the border of Russia, but into Russia. Uh, very much along the lines of some of the comments we heard last night, uh, a, a, a 
a Europe, a Euro Atlantic area, whole and free from Vancouver to Vladivostok, as as impossible as that may seem today. Uh, we should set our aspirations high. A free and democratic Russia as part of that, but a free and democratic Ukraine soon. The um, the, uh, the the Euro Atlantic area in that context can also be a, a critical mass, a convening uh, influence, an attraction to other countries around the world. It's, it's exactly the kind of balance we need against the rise of China, where we aren't, we aren't seeking to contain or get into conflict with China, but rather creating incentives for a country like China to move our way. Because we've built a scale around the free markets, around the democratic societies, that serve as a counterweight or even an attraction to countries. Today, by being divided in so many areas between the United States and Europe, we absolutely divide the most important part of our power, which is the attraction of the ideas and the principles on which the transatlantic relationship stands. Absolutely. Ginny, what does your work look like in 10 years where Microsoft, and we're seeing where the, the private sector, the commercialization, I would say, this is a war in Ukraine dominated by commercial drones, by, by uh, Starlink, by other uh, Amazon's work, your work. What does this look like in 10 years, uh, private sector that involved in geopolicy? I mean, that's a big question. And, and the, the 10 years out question framing can either be the magic wand of like, this is what I would like it to be versus the, this is what is likely to be. You can do both. And, <laughs> sure. And if, uh, if I were able to predict what 10 years from now look like from a technology standpoint, I'm probably in a slightly different job than the one I'm in. As, as leading- Do we have jobs in the next <laughs> 10 years? <laughs> <my> question. Uh, <laughs> leading a team focused on democracy, I, I will start by saying, I hope there's not a need for a private sector company to have such a team. Um, I would hope that, that we, have, we have all collectively done such a great job that we've moved past trying to figure out how we can help advance and protect fundamental rights through tech, which is how, what we think about right now, and that we move into a place where we're working more on maintenance and growth and strengthening. I think we have a lot of problems still very much unresolved around the world where democracy really hinges on, on success there. And so if you sort of, you know, flip the coin and imagine a world in which we kind of manage to get disinformation under control, um, get to a place where society is resilient to information, they're able to um, think critically and make their own decisions with the information in front of them, where we have freedom of expression, but also the ability to, to think critically about information and news, that's going to lead to a much more stable environment. And stability in democracies is actually one of the reasons that technology companies or private sector generally should be thinking so much about the importance of these issues. To the point of rule of law, um, companies do better in environments where there's rule of law. You know, democracy is good for business. It's important for us to be able to operate in a place where we can anticipate what's going to happen, um, where we can trust the laws of the country that we're working in, where creativity can, th can flourish and thrive. Um, and these are all the reasons why we're so invested in, uh, in trying to push democracy forward and protect it where it exists. So 10 years from now, I hope my program doesn't exist. I hope we're thriving and I hope that we're, we're dealing with a free and independent Ukraine where they continue to innovate with their technology as they've done. We've seen them year over year continue to innovate even during a war. Their tech sector is the one sector that seems to continue to improve and increase. And so that, that's sort of the vision that I have for 10 years from now. And the role of Microsoft in that is to, is to be consistently a partner to those who are looking to innovate and build on top of technology. I like these visions. Okay, let's bring in your visions. Who has some questions for our great audience? We're going to do rapid questions, uh, and then we're going to, oh, good, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hop into your chair. I'm going to take you. a load off. Thank you. Please give me a warm round of applause for Vice President. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so we'll take the two questions over here. If we have a microphone runner, please, right here. Introduce yourself, and I mean crisp, 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 and then I will take two over here, and then we'll come back. Me first? Okay. This is a quick one. And I pr I oh, please introduce yourself. Yeah, sorry. S Steve LaWarn, a, a partner from Deloitte. Um, we have to remember the Marshall Plan was one country helping many, and now we're in a position of many countries helping one. So my question is about the virtue of patience. The Americans and the EU need to work together on this, and from my experience in Reconstruction, 
the U.S. can often become impatient with the, the real issues that the European Union have to handle. The best example is accession. My question, actually, I'm looking at you because the question is really for N N NATO. Is it possible that NATO could be a bridge to impose patience on the Americans for what really has to be done with Ukraine? Because Ukraine is joining, hopefully, the European area. They're not joining necessarily the United States, obviously, maybe in a trade agr agreement. But it's, a, it's an important issue. If patience isn't there, then the alliance to rebuild Ukraine could begin to crack a bit. Thank you. I think we'll take one more back there, please. Just real quick, we're going to go speed. Hi, Ali Atalay from Coach Holding Istanbul. It's great to see an ex-boss sitting at the panel. Hi, Steve. Um, uh, my, my question is definitely not to you. We have good relations. My question is to Ambassador Smith. Uh, uh, you mentioned Indo-Pacific at the beginning of your speech when you said looking forward. Uh, Indo-Pacific is definitely not unrelated to uh, transatlantic relations and Atlanticism anymore. So how do you see the role of NATO and uh, general transatlantic cooperation looking forward? Thank you. In, Thank in the Indo-Pacific. And we'll take the two questions over here, then I'm going to come back to the panel. Thank you very much. My name is Alana Halushka. I'm from Ukraine, International Center for Ukrainian Victory. And a vice a president made a very important remark that transatlantic values and security helped rebuilding Europe after the World War II. Uh, right now, over the last year, we speak a lot about uh, Ukrainian recovery. We had conference in Lugano last year. We had a number of forums in um, Berlin, Paris, Rome. Um, in London is coming and everybody speaks obviously about uh, businesses, about investment, a lot about transparency and fight against corruption, which um, myself as an anti-corruption activist, I definitely consider to be a very important thing, but that is just one leg. The second leg, the second important pillar, and let's be honest, uh, for businesses to join Ukrainian reconstruction and recovery market, they have to have effective security guarantees. We've seen already Budapest Memorandum, we've seen already Minsk deal, and I'll definitely say something which is an elephant in the room, that anything short of Ukraine's NATO membership will not be a sustainable security guarantee. That is why I have the question, probably mostly to, to the ambassador, but uh, other people also here, why allies are reluctant to uh, accept, to recognize this, um, and to welcome Ukraine uh, at the Vilnius summit to issue official uh, invitation and start the accession process, which will obviously take time, because even for Finland it took one year, and what can we as Ukrainian civil society, Ukrainian actors do in order to convince partners to accept this reality and start implementing it? Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Let me, let me come back. I know, Julie, there was some fire towards you, but I, I, we're really talking about the strategic patience versus strategic urgency. I'm a little more on the urgent part of that, but how do you manage that? NATO Indo-Pacific, um, and I, this NATO security guarantees question would, would love thoughts from Steve as, as well, but handle any of those as you wish. Um, so uh, the first question, I mean, I, I, I don't know that NATO will have the role you're envisioning in terms of bridging the divide between the US and the EU. I mean, no doubt the way in which the United States with the EU, with NATO have come together in this moment to respond to this unprovoked war inside Ukraine has been amazing. And it starts a new chapter in transatlantic cooperation and NATO-EU cooperation. But on the reconstruction part, it's harder for me to get there in part because of what NATO's core mission is. And I think when we get to reconstruction, <coughs> the, the crux of that will be with individual institutions, uh, individual nations, um, but also the European European Union and other multilateral institutions that are built for those types of tasks. NATO, no doubt, will <coughs> have a role in uh, NATO, uh, Ukraine's recovery um, and particularly its longer term modernization. Um, but uh, the degree to which it can play some sort of bridging role between the United States and EU, I guess uh, it's hard for me to lay that out in concrete terms. What I can say on the Indo Pacific question um, on how does NATO look at the Indo-Pacific and its role vis-a-vis -vis that region. I mean, first and foremost, NATO allies 
put the PRC in the strategic concept for the first time last summer because of what the PRC is doing in and around the Euro-Atlantic area. The way in which the Chinese are relying on an array of hybrid tactics, whether it's economic coercion or disinformation, malicious cyber attacks, um, the list goes on and on. These are challenges for which the alliance had desires to be ready to address. So we are building resilience. We're building stronger tools as it relates to protecting our technological edge and protecting against cyber attacks. But the reason we're partnering with some of the countries in the Indo-Pacific is because their lessons in coping with China's hybrid toolkit are directly relevant to some of the lessons we across NATO have drawn from responding to Russia's hybrid toolkit. And in fact, what we're finding is that toolkit looks more and more uh, as a mirror image of each other in terms of what those two countries are using to, to try to divide Europe from within and divide Europe from the United States. Um, so we believe there's plenty of good work to go around, but no, we are not talking about expanding NATO into the Indo-Pacific. It remains a Euro-Atlantic military uh, alliance. On the question of uh, enlargement, I mean, We've been clear on this. Obviously, NATO has taken the decision. It took the decision in 2008 to state that Ukraine will be a member of, of the alliance. And w the challenge now is to determine when we get to Vilnius, hopefully with President Zelensky in person, how we can continue to signal that we're not changing that policy, that we acknowledge the progress has been made, and that NATO wants a longer-term relationship with Ukraine that stretches above and beyond the important support that it's providing right now in terms of its individual member states. But for the United States, the focus does remain on the short term. The focus is very much on ensuring that the practical support that Ukrainian military commanders require to succeed on the battlefield is flowing rapidly, as rapidly as possible, <coughs> into Ukraine so that they can prevail on the battlefield. So practical support is the first priority, but yes, when we get to Vilnius, we'll be talking about NATO's longer-term relationship with Ukraine. Thank you, Julie. This was really a great session. Thank you so much for your insights. I really much appreciate, Steve, thank you for reading the Atlantic Charter. I felt like I should have given homework <laughs> for this assignment, and you, you completed the homework and wrote the essay, and it, Chat it BT didn't do it. It was never produced in print. It was telegraphed from a British ship, and that's the only written form that actually exists. I will say, only in Brussels Forum will you get that <laughs> level of detail. Please join me in thanking our fantastic panelists for a great conversation. Thank you.